Welcome to Dead Man Talking. Tonight's story is a return in the incredible series by Michael G. Lockhart. Of course, as ever, please do let me know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. And so, with that aside, let's get into tonight's story. Entitled Bloody Bones and Green Eyes Part 5 Whispering Pines The Search for Dakota Dawson Let's get straight into that. One way or another, I'm gonna find ya. I'm gonna get you, get you, get you, get you. One way or another, Blondie. Harry ran his hands through his hair. Dylan, I actually understand as much as anyone can why you feel the need to look for yourself. I had to go help look for my best friend, Ronald, once we were able to get into the area. However, it's extraordinarily dangerous. We had hunters address that rabid wolf pack, but we don't know if they got them all. INAC, Indigenous and Northern Affairs Canada, is still clear in the area, and we're not taking in tour groups. I'm not sure if we'll ever take a group back that way. The young man who bore a close resemblance to his younger sister nodded. I get it, but we're not tourists. I'm working on a master's in climatology and Jose and Trey have been in the military reserves, and Derek is a hiker and has hunted deer. We can do this. We're all fit and we have a good cause to see for ourselves. Try to find my sister. Even if she's... Even if she's like Hannah. He trowed off in misery and glanced at Trey, who quietly seethed. Well, look, if you can just wait a couple of days, maybe I can get a specialist up here. And one of the members of our expedition who handled himself very well, Harry suggested. But Dylan looked a little surprised. I didn't know that there were other survivors. I thought it was just you. Well, Harry shrugged. Uh, there were two. The other were just baggage. No real use. Some jumped up blogger. Not sure that the competent man would do it, but uh, he's pretty special. Well, I can go, but... I'll have to charge it. I just can't afford not to do with. Ah, oh, that's happened. He hoped that charging a fee would dissuade the young hothead. And Dylan nodded. Ah, oh, let's do it. My parents will pay. I don't want to wait. And we have almost a month before classes start. We can't afford to lose even a couple of days. Maybe your friend can catch us up. Or we can spare a few hours while we get packed up and ready. That should give you time to call him. Later that night, TJ's phone rang and the screen lit up with Uncle Jim. He quickly answered. Hello, Uncle Jim? Yep, how's my favourite great nephew? Haha, <laughs> good sir. My scars are coming in nicely. And Jim snorted. Ha, <laughs> good. I'm sure your girlfriend likes them. Look, are you by yourself? Uh, yes, sir. Mum's at work and Cassie's out riding a four-wheeler with Will. It's just me in the house. Hmm, good. Because uh, I'm going to make you an offer. Sort of a summer internship. Uh, you can refuse, but uh, it's better than anything you get paid in that no-horse town. Risky, maybe it's hard physically, but uh, it has some potential to do you some, some good. Maybe help you set up a career path. Plus... You get to see the Yukon, something I only managed a few months past. Huh, <laughs> sure, yes sir. I'm not getting any hours of work anyway. Is this just for me or... And Jim huffed in amusement. Ha, <laughs> you can bring two others and one of them cannot be your girlfriend. She's smart but she can't track or fight or shoot. Well, I'm sure Will and Casey will be on board, but I'm not sure about Mum or Miss Cheryl. 
I'll handle the parents. Let me know what the others say. As soon as you know. TJ, this will be more dangerous in some ways than the big cat hunts. Don't worry about supplies or weapons. Your cousin Ed can help us with all of that. We may be able to get a contract, which will help her and her company. You work on your friends and I work on the business angle and parents. And then we can meet in the middle. Oh, and I need to say, the only thing the moms need to know is that we're talking about a free trip and we'll be going to the land of Canada. You see, told you it would be easy. Brain rumbled to his apprentice as he looked through the one-way glass at the most recently infected member of the four men that Bjorn had helped to retrieve from the northern city. The others were in adjacent holding areas, but were in much more degenerated conditions. Justin here has had his first treatment. The others, well, we figured out who they are, or were. He corrected himself. Applicants for our out-front operations. Employees who don't know just how extensive and well financially successful we are. Bjorn nodded. Are we trading the first three or just letting them go through the rotting process? And Brain looked at the large young man askance. Sarcasm? Why are you just asking? Sometimes I, I can't tell. Bjorn snorted. Probably both. But let's pretend I was just asking. Nicely. And Brain smiled. You're getting better, no matter what the other managers say. Oh, this weaponized combination virus and fungus came from our competitors in China. Unfortunately, it is a bloodborne pathogen. Hard to get infected. Otherwise, Justin's whole family and the medical staff at the hospital, or lots of folks would be, or like these. Thanks to other illnesses sent to us from that part of the world, the doctors were cautious and quickly quarantined Justin. And that's where he spent the rest of the winter and the spring. Not like they knew whom to call. Fortunately, we always have fillers out for the weird stuff. It is, after all, a stock in trade. The three green lumps, but Tom and William, and they for all the world, remind me of those trolls in The Hobbit. The way they argue, it would have already infected the entire population of the plant area down by that river had they continued to roam free. But they were getting aggressive and territorial. If the initial subject of our competitors has made it to our warehouse instead of that of the intermediary, he shuddered. Bottom line, they are too far gone for what we're trying with Justin. So, we're going to have a Hail Mary. Last ditch, nothing to lose treatment, like we did with your friend on that Aslan adventure, the Cobalt program. We're still experimenting with limbs, so not too sure how much good a full body transplant will do them, especially with their minds. Now, since this mission was a cakewalk and you returned so quickly, we have one that may be more of a challenge. How do you feel about the far reaches of the Northwest American continent? Great place to visit in July. Bear country. Well, his toothy grin grew wider. Those are definitely Dakota's clothes. A yellow parka, orange sweater and those ugly pink boots with a D on the side, Dylan exclaimed. Well, I thought you said that the team searched this area thoroughly. He looked at Harry suspiciously. Trey glowered and the other two gaped like fish on the bank of a stream, awaiting the actions of their more assertive peers to guide them. Well, Harry stood still, a look of concerned concentration on his features. We did search this area. It's where we found Ronald and Hannah. Or oh, their remains. RCMP even processed the scene. We had people crawling all over these rocks for days. There's no way we would have missed those items. They're not even hidden. I remember telling your sister that she would be easy to spot, even in a snowstorm. When he trailed off and peered into the middle distance, clearly lost once more in memories of the tragedy that had befallen his last expedition. Dylan relented and then started calling out, Dakota! The others soon joined the chorus until Harry convinced them that it would do no good. And he insisted that 
They'd be better off breaking into search teams. And from within the brush, several sets of eyes observed the party that searched the boulder field. One set of eyes in particular looked at the angry young man with a shock of dark hair, so like her own. Dakota, he called. Such a familiar word. No, name. It was, it had been her name, but no longer. She was Dayak of the Wendigo, and she carried the child of her mate, the Deathwalker, and Nokwa. At least the older woman told her so. Their child would be part of the next generation that would stalk these creatures who dared to enter their lands and roast them on the fires or eat them raw as the prey they were. Her anger rose and obscured any thoughts of familiarity or kinship with these intruders. Thank you, Miss Joyce, Jim Broxton rasped. We'd have taken much longer to get this far on our own. No problem, Jim. With traffic from the search teams from a few weeks ago, we ended up with a fairly well-marked trail that leads to the boulder field. Harry said that they would begin their search there. I'm sorry that David and I can't go further, but we're the only ones left to mine the shop. Are you sure you'll be able to find it? The old man grinned. <laughs> we'll manage, and if not, we'll have the super-duper radios and We'll holler if need be. Hopefully, we can do them some good and get in a good vacation for the young'uns. By the time the crew had reached the other side of the river, Jim and his team were well inside the tree line and had begun the early stages of their ascent. Cassie, you're up. You have your map and compass? Yes, sir. The young teen eagerly approached her great uncle. Ready to land and navigate? Good. We don't have far to go. I'm sure we'll have some more treks over the next two weeks. So you other two will get to test your skills as well. GPS is great, but when it fails, we have to know how to get around anyway. Now, before we get started, unpack those long objects and assemble them. The ammo will be heavy to tote, but you'll be glad of it when the time comes. I don't think these guys know what they're doing. Trey grouched to his best friend as they tramped along, searching their quadrant. No way that stuff was just sitting out there like that. Somebody must have found it and stacked it under the boulder. And Dylan nodded. Yeah, this Harry guy knows something he's not telling us. Well, he's capable enough, but I don't trust him. Jose and Derek, they'll keep an eye on him. We need to find my sister. I don't know why, but I just feel like she's alive, somewhere. Well, the clothes proved it. Maybe she's found a way to survive. Maybe she's found somebody to help. Always weirdos who hide out in the sticks. Huh, Canadian hillbillies, Trey half joked. He very fully joked. He was a very serious-minded young man. And that's why Dylan liked him. And Dylan looked at Trey. Speaking of hills... We have some daylight left, but those peaks are throwing some serious shade. Pretty dark inside the trees. Maybe we should... Well, he didn't finish the thought. From the depths of the forest, there came a throaty whisper, full of anguish. Just a hint of longing. Help! Help! Brother! Harry, Jose, and Derek searched their own quadrant, and Derek spoke up from the rear of the line. Are you sure this is the best way to do this? Seems like we could each go out on our own and do better. And how many times do I have to explain it, Einstein? Harry internally rolled his eyes. Yes, we don't know what else or even who else may be in the forest. And besides, the terrain is often rough and easy for the ground to get out from under the foot or for something to fall or for a predator to appear before one can react. And Jose glumly trod forward. Yeah, well, we didn't have to do this stuff in the Navy Reserves. Walking in the woods was for giants. Ain't it about time to go back and meet with the others? And far in the distance, there was a cry. 
a lonesome, piteous sound that turned into a wail that hinted of, of lust, not for pleasure, but for blood. What was that? Jose and Derek exclaimed as one. Harry froze, a shock of adrenaline started in his heart and he shuddered and remembered horror. Prob probably just a, a loon or something. You are right. Uh, let's go back and rendezvous. On the way, he had to explain that a loon was a bird, not just an insult that he hadn't tried to offend either of these geniuses. I think it came from over here, and Trey pointed to the left. Maybe ten o'clock? Dylan shook his head. Nah, we veered a little that way already. I asked more straight ahead and a little right. They argued for a little while. They followed the voice for a better part of half an hour. It never seemed to close in on it. Come, brother, help me. The voice enticed from their right. March closer this time. They whipped their heads in that direction and searched with their eyes. I don't see. Wait, Dylan exclaimed. There, through the trees. Where it gets kind of dark. Something, something pale, skinny. A rustle sounded from straight ahead, and Trey looked up startled. A deer? I know I saw antlers, he mumbled. When he turned back to look at Dylan, he discovered that his friend had rushed towards the sound of the voice in a thin, ghostly figure. He looked back at where he'd seen the antlers for just a moment and then turned back to follow Dylan, who now dodged between the trees and occasionally disappeared among the shadows. He started to jog after the young man. He heard another rustle of leaves and limbs to his left, and when he spared a glance, he saw a pale, spikes, freaky, he thought. He had no time for other thoughts, for when he turned back to look for signs of Dylan, an old rusted camp hatchet swished towards him and was buried between his sullen eyes. Ah, uh, they're an hour late, Jose fumed. Where are they? Well, Harry shrugged. I don't know any more than you do. We had very clear search areas. If they found anything, they should have returned. If one of them was injured, they should have used the walkie to let us know. Trey is military. Surely he could operate that kind of radio. And Jose bristled. Why, he can't do nothing if he's hurt, man. And Derek added, Dylan's pretty smart, but he ain't thinking about time. He just wants to find his sister. And Harry nodded. Well, they're not answering on that little radio and... We haven't heard a distress whistle or any yelling. However, we can't take any chances. We should search their area and see if we can find them. It'll be night soon or at least dark and we don't want to stumble around in the murk. Another day and another familiar face. That old man. He'd been kind to her, hadn't he? The tribe had only recently returned to the area after the bad people left, the ones with the guns and funny equipment. This was the summertime hunting area. Meat would come here to fish or ride in boats. There were settlements upriver and she'd come from one. Her mate and others played the hunting game with her brother and other men while she and her party watched the new arrivals, the new meat. And three young and tender prey folk walked along with the old one, and she was sure that he would be tough and stringy and hard to chew. The loud, long screeching wail stopped Jim's party in their tracks. Get low, he said at a conversational volume. The three young people complied and each scanned a pre-assigned quadrant first, then glanced at others before returning for a second. Hard look at their own. And starting with Cassie, they each reported, no signs. And Jim noted in satisfaction that all three had unslung their rifles and had them at the ready. That was no loon, he rasped. Likely our skinny pointy friends are 
lurking nearby. Maybe just curious, but they always eventually get hungry. Keep a sharp eye and remember, we don't follow them. Uh, we're almost to the boulder field. Could be they are playing games with Harry and company and we've heard something that was not about us. Keep the rifles unslung and if we have to engage, be careful of civilians. Now Dylan caught several flashes of pale skin that always remained just ahead of him as he dodged through trees. The bowls were now bigger, the trees taller as they headed down slope, yet the canopy above still provided deep shadows. He yelled for Dakota to stop running from him, and that he was there to help her. He yelled until he was hoarse, and he sprinted ahead at each glimpse or noise until he was exhausted. He panted heavily and paused to get his bearings. The sun was sinking fast, and the shadows cast by the mountains and trees grew long and deep. But he couldn't figure out where he was. He looked around and called out for his safety body, his best friend. Trey? Where are you, Trey? His voice echoed dimly, but there was no reply, only silence. His hopes flashed when he heard a noise, but it was only the sowing of the wind through the branches above. And there was a steady thumping and throbbing, only his pounding pulse. And there, a flash of something white within the deepest shadows, near a fallen forest giant. Spikes? No, antlers. And they rose above the fallen trunk and kept rising. Too tall, his mind glibbered in terror. That thing is too skinny and too tall, and it is not built right. It turned and fled at its top speed. Uh, we have to build up the fire so that Dylan and Trey might see it. That's the best chance of helping them find us. So, gather some more wood, please. Harry had had about enough of the knuckle-draggers. He'd almost slipped and called Jose, Robert Goddard. Yet, he knew that the ignoramus would likely not know that he'd been mockingly called a rocket scientist. He didn't usually mind explaining things. In fact, he enjoyed sharing information and skills with his clients. However, these two were stubbornly stupid and rude to boot. I ain't going out in the dark to look for no more wood, Jose proclaimed. Since we've been here, all you talk about is safety bodies. Now you want us to go out into the dark by ourselves? Actually, I wanted you to go as a pair while I turned the fire. And believe it or not, there is a skill to that. And Harry looked over at Derek. Well, how about you? Nothing to say? And Derek shrugged and started to walk out into the dark. Oh, I don't care. I'll go get some more. Oh, it's lying on the ground all over the place. Just have to pick it up and bring it. Well, Jose looked angrily at his friend but then said, Hold up, D. Let me get a flashlight. Well, Harry kept his ears open while the two city boys crashed and fumbled about in the dark. They discovered a novel way to find firewood. They tripped over it. He rolled his eyes. Maybe Darwin was wrong. And then the sound that he had dreaded for months, that had haunted his nightmares and all too many waking moments, echoed through the dark forest. That miserable, hungry wail. As it died out, he heard Einstein and Goddard exchange WTF comments. And presently, they came crashing into campsite. Naturally, they carried no wood. They dropped it in their panic. Well, they heard nothing for a while, and then Harry had to drag both of them out to where they dropped what they had already collected, and Harry picked up a few more scraps and they all headed back to the fire. As they piled the wood, night vision destroyed by the bright flames and Jose's flashlight that he had insisted on shining on each of his comrades' eyes, a voice penetrated from the night, Dylan's voice. Help, come save us, sir. Oh, as he looked up in delight, Dylan, Trey, over here. Harry raised his hand and waved to try and get Jose's attention. That's not Dylan, it's... Before he could finish, Jose clicked on his flashlight and dashed into the woods to seek his friend. 
Dylan, I'm coming. I, I got you, bro. Well, Harry expected Derek to go plunging headlong after his buddy, but, but the young man just stood there, blinking, like a steer chewing its cud and contemplating a hammer that was about to bean it in the skull and turn it into steaks. He looked at Harry. I think you're right. That ain't Dylan. Hey, Joe. That ain't Dylan. The bobbin, waving flashlight beam had disappeared, and there was a steady, dull glow on the ground in the general direction Jose had run. Harry, whose fists were now filled with a large framed revolver, said, Come on, maybe we can get to him before they finish their little game. They have only smoke up ahead. Can't see it, but sure reeks. Will unnecessarily informed the others. Wonder why they're be sitting around playing with a fire. Eh, one way to find out, TJ proclaimed as he stalked forward, rifle at the ready. Harold Hereford of the Yukon. You've sure looked better. Uncle Jim awakened his erstwhile battle buddy with his rusted old man's voice. A little softness had crept into it of late and a little more hair had crept from his head, and what was left had turned a dull white from the snowy mane it had been. This trek of only a few hours had all but exhausted him. Must be getting old, the old octogenarian mused. And Harry opened his eyes and looked up blearily from where he'd fallen asleep on sentry duty. Jim, you're back, and so are they. After introductions, Harry looked around at Jim's idea of a rescue party. No offense, sir, but these are just a bunch of kids. And Cassie cleared her throat. Careful, partner. We're armed and dangerous in our own right. Jim gave her a hard look. Why did we discuss about holding our braggadocious nature and ignoring potentially offensive comments? And Cassie bit back her typical sassy response. No point in getting offended, she recited. He might not have meant it that way, and reacting to it wastes energy. They could be put to better use solving problems. And Jim nodded. Good. Harry, I promise you, these just aren't any kids. They are an experimental program, raising young'uns in a DMTS way. It is what we do. They're already good at moving in the woods as any of your crew, and they have faced down. Well, you know. And Harry pulled a rueful look. <laughs> Above my pay grade? The young people grinned and Will said, You really do know, Uncle Jim. And Derek stood by, mouth breathing and looking confused. They'd found Jose's flashlight, but no sign of the man himself. In the morning, they'd gone back to the same area and found a few splashes of dried blood. Harry had kept them near the fire the rest of the morning, hoping that Trey and Dylan would return, or his backup team would arrive. Apparently, they had. Bunch of brats, he mumbled before he went back to gaping. The rest gave him cool glances and Harry stood shaking his head. I've already lost three out of four, including my money man, Dakota's brother Dylan. Uh, you ever considered a Another line of work, Harry. You aren't exactly good at keeping your expeditions alive. Jim regretted that comment immediately. He knew it was hurtful and counterproductive. A bad example for the young'uns. But it was already out there. Harry gaped for a moment. I... I have been doing some soul searching. This should be a busy season, but people are still talking about my cursed adventure tour. I'm only still afloat because of the DMTS reward. Plus, uh, plus I feel miserable. No one local to discuss it with, until yesterday. It was easy to keep a secret. No one would have believed me. Besides, I saw that that John guy put out some conspiracy stuff on his blog. Then he and the blog stopped. I called him, but his phone it was no longer in service. I think DMTS meant what they said about breaking agreements with them. I wasn't about to try. Well, Jim frowned. I'm sorry about that, Harry. I sometimes forget to pull my punches and I've been feeling irritable. 
downright mean lately. So, what's the situation? You and perhaps your rude-eyed friend can brief us? When Harry told him about finding Dakota's parka, sweater, and boots, Jim grew thoughtful. Well, they may have learned that trick from others. The wilderness is large and in charge of this part of the world. People tend to live crowded together in cities and towns for warmth and security. That leaves a lot of space for those who live out on the fringes and for different intelligences. And Dylan ran until he dropped next to a freezing stream that flowed strongly from above. He found a rocky outcropping in the feeble moonlight and burrowed in amidst the solid bones of earth. He had no weapons but a camp knife that he now considered absurdly small and inadequate. Harry had warned them that even in the summertime, temperatures could drop pretty low at night, especially with a low humidity. He was in a confined space as he could find and soon his own body heat combined with the fear and exertion of the evening combined to lull him into a fitful slumber. He was once again searching for Dakota. He called for her over and over in the grey twilight of his dreams. He looked around for Trey and saw him in the distance. He called out to his friend and walked towards him. He had never seemed to be able to close the distance. And then a white glow appeared behind the young man and a spiky creature with pale limbs that bespoke the grave and putridity rose above Trey's outlined figure. The distance rapidly closed and the slavering, misshapen, elongated moor enveloped his friend and a splash of crimson gore obscured his vision. He was back by the stream, ensconced in his little rock haven. He had grown cold and his breath steamed. He decided to get up and walk around to get his blood flowing. He paced along the rocky bank and waved his arms and stamped his feet, but nothing seemed to warm him. He paused when he heard a voice out in a forest of fear. A faint, mesmerizing chant that spoke of longing to be with him. At first it made his eyes tear. He realized that it was her, his dear little sister, Dakota. The low chant changed tone and became harsh and accusing. Other voices joined in that spoke of other longings for flesh. They spoke of a desire to drink his hot blood and chew upon his tasty organs. And the white glow returned and grew in intensity until he could barely stand it. His eyes snapped open and he immediately squinted them against the glare of the early morning sun as it lanced through the opening to his earthly cocoon. And like the proverbial moth to the flame, he rose to that celestial beacon and climbed forth into its full light and warmth. Why, he was stiff and sore and soon found himself actually tramping back and forth and waving his arms to regain circulation and flexibility. In the fresh light of morning, he took stock of his situation. And he refilled his depleted water bottle in the stream and fished out one of the energy bars that Harry had insisted they carry at all times. He was grateful and wished that he had been more willing to heed the man's advice. This was, after all, his part of the world. And then again, Dylan hadn't been very reasonable since the news that Dakota was missing had arrived. And they were close, with no other siblings, and he'd always been protective of her. Now he felt as though he'd found her before he'd even got started. He had lost track of Trey and the others. It was time to think, time to plan out what to do. Not hard. He'd follow the stream and it would lead to the river. He'd follow that until he came to the trail. They'd follow to reach the boulder field. It had taken only a couple of hours of hiking to reach it from the river, back when he'd been full of energy and on the verge of rage. The anger had subsided, at last replaced by a more reasonable, determination to find out what had happened to his sister and whether he could help her. He set off along the stream. Well, it was rough going. He had to cross several smaller branches of water and soon heard a rushing sound ahead. He found where the stream entered the river from the slight rise. 
He took the path up river and in a surprisingly short time found the trailhead. He picked up the pace and eagerly rushed to rejoin his companions. They would now need to find both Dakota and Trey. Yet he was filled with an unexpected rush of confidence. Somehow he knew that they would succeed. They had to. They'd all work so hard. He slowed a little, his exuberance tempered with caution. Those things were still out there in the trees. He shivered, despite the warm light of day, while exerting himself climbing the trail. Her mate and the elder woman had beaten her, not severely. They didn't want to harm the child they believed she carried. I did my best, she wailed internally, keeping her sobs of pain and misery inside her own skull. Expressing them would earn only more cuffs and abuse. I chanted and sang and called to him, to Dylan, to my brother. He wouldn't come for me. No one would. It's not my fault that the hunters couldn't find him. Or maybe I should go and look for him. If they would leave me alone. No! My mates would kill me, child or no child. The tribe would cook me alive and then eat me. No matter how hard I screamed and fought. Dylan glanced around as the early afternoon light sent fingers of shadow stabbing towards him. Even in daylight, it could be dark under those limbs. He knew that it was getting near the boulder field. He had to be. Oh, I just hope everyone made it back to camp. They're probably looking for me. His thoughts trailed off when a blunt object struck the side of his head and sent him to the ground. Senses reeling and head feeling suddenly like it weighed a ton. He heard a bark of triumph and felt a rough, bony hands pour at him. He glimpsed the silhouette of a thin, spiky figure as it raised a knife high above his chest. He was stunned, physically and emotionally, but he was unable to even raise a hand to defend himself. The murderous outline squawked and disappeared. Dylan heard a faint thud and wet crunch as the figure landed on the ground. A large, long object passed over its head and he heard a grunt as an impact of a different timber. A boot at the end of a long leg as it stuck in a living body. And there were more scuffling sounds and then a meaty, muted grinding noise. He shook his head, all the while trying to focus. His vision blurred in and out and he was dizzy, though the weight in his head had reduced to about a quarter ton. A new silhouette appeared, and this time a deeper shadow against the backdrop of the shade from the trees. At first, he was sure it was a fabled Sasquatch, but it resolved into a very large young man with wild hair, like fire, and a very nice outdoorsman-style clothing. He found an enormous paw, uh, hand, extended towards his chest, and a basso voice growled. There were four. One got away while I finished off the other three. Best we get up on this incline and meet with the rest. The comment was followed by a wide, toothy grin. Well, Dylan didn't know whether to grasp the offered hand or to run. The grin was friendly, but somehow feral. In the end, he knew that he couldn't run. He wasn't sure he could even stand on his own. And so he reached for the paw and soon found himself on his feet, embraced. And the voice rumbled. They hit you hard. Weren't worried about you, needing to heal later. You likely have concussion. No fun. Let me take a look at your eyes. With that, Dylan felt himself pulled in close to a too large figure, and he tried unsuccessfully to shut his eyes, when thick but nimble fingers pried open, each in turn. Yep. One is normal, and the other is dilated. I'll give you a hand. The rest of the way. And with that, Dylan felt the too long arm go around his shoulders, and take more weight from his body than he would have imagined possible. As they awkwardly trundled upslope, he looked around at the bodies they left scattered in their wake. The knife wielder lay in a strange heap, and he had been sent crashing headfirst into the hard soil. It hadn't done him much good. 
His head had been rammed pretty far into his upper body. Another leg stretched out, his chest dished in a way that spoke of crushed vital organs, no longer protected by their shattered ribs, and the third rested against the trunk of a tree. It would have looked like he was sitting there, peacefully, except that his face was to the tree and his legs extended backwards at a ninety-degree angle, his spine clearly shattered along with his face. He looked up at his new best friend. Who? Who are you? He asked in a voice he barely recognised as his own. It was weak and squeaky, broken like that of an adolescent. Beyond, the thunderous voice replied. I'm here on a contract to meet with and assist Jim Broxton. Have you seen the man? Still nothing. They definitely took your boy last night. Likely in a cook pot or roasting on an open fire like a chestnut. Jim rasped. He was out of breath and TJ worried for the elder. He just didn't look like himself. He was able to do everything, but it clearly taxed him in fatigue and discomfort. Perhaps we should take some water and a little food before we go out for the last look. We need to save some energy since we know that they're likely to attack at night. Derek looked on suddenly. Even if Jose is gone, we gotta find Dylan and Trey. We don't know what happened to them. And Harry, exasperation on his face, had had his fill. Look, Einstein, we already told you. We'll look today. We'll camp tonight with these boulders behind us and a big fire in front. With real guards. Armed guards. Tomorrow, we go down and get help. All of us. So how about collecting some firewood for later while I prepare lunch? I'm sure the Junior Explorers Club will help. Or at least pull watch while you pick up sticks. And Derek started to object and took a stance as though he wanted to carry the argument to a level where he'd have a chance at winning. Words and thinking were not his strong suit. Hey, mother f- Hello, the camp! A deep voice roared from behind him. In his angry state, it startled him. He whipped his head and saw Dylan being dragged by a bear in nice clothing. No, a bear-like man. Pion the bear cop, Uncle Jim grinned. Heard about you from my daughter, Ed. Looks like she managed to get at least a single field agent contract. Harry and Derek attended to Dylan while the rest of the group assembled just out of earshot. Bjorn looked a little startled. Ed's father? That's a real pleasure, sir. She saved me from a life of, well, let's just say, a downward spiral. I owe her the world, or at least my part in it. He extended his paw-like hand and shook with the elder Broxton. This is your team? He looked at the three youngsters, who all looked back in a little awe, but prepared to bristle if he mentioned their ages. He nodded and extended his hand to the tall boy who favoured Ed and gave his name as TJ. He greeted each of the others in turn, and Bjorn nodded and grinned. The cryptic cat crew. Great job with those things. A real challenge. And instead of the glowers that had threatened, he received chests swollen with pride and faces lit with genuine appreciation that he had mentioned their accomplishments without mentioning their ages. And he looked at Jim once more, who wore a weary grin that showed yellow teeth in his white beard. I had definitely got better teeth, he thought, before he could stop himself. Ah, but those same eyes, the look right through you, kind of, weigh you, measure you, and render judgment before you can draw your next breath, kind of eyes. And they discussed the current plan, and Bjorn informed them that the cannibals would likely be animated tonight, unless they decided to enjoy a feast on their Wendigo brothers. And Jim nodded. That means we've taken out nine of them, or thereabouts. Can't be too many of fighting age left. I got six back this spring, including one of the costume handlers. I hate weird cultist types, especially when they want to eat me. They ought to have better sense. Bjorn looked inward for a moment. Yes, sir. I don't much care for cults myself. They have way of uh, spreading pure misery and mayhem. But as for weird, that's what we do. 
and they eventually agreed to set out traps rather than wander aimlessly in search of Jose and Trey. And Jim explained to Derek and Dylan, who now rested as comfortably as possible on a blanket, an emergency ice pack, now warm and soggy, served him for a pillow. I know that they are your friends, but we've had experience with these things. At best, we'll find remains or blood evidence. I'm sorry, but, but your friends are gone. And your sister, she's likely dead as well. He looked hard at Dylan. We should really extract you. Concussions are dangerous. Harry tells me that you got pretty agitated over the idea, but come tomorrow, we'll be ready for a helicopter ride. Don't worry, we'll stay here and search for the others. If any of them are alive, we'll find them. Or if not, well, we'll recover their remains and give them a decent send-off with a full knowledge of their families. Now, rest as best you can. We're all armed and beyond over there is a weapon of himself. Just look at that bush knife he carries. Calls it a scammer's axe, like the old Saxon and Viking blades. Be glad he's on our side. Those Wendigos may just decide to sleep tonight. But if not, they'll suffer, rousing us. The old one and the bear man have taken nine of our hunters, exclaimed Nokcha, the lead death walker. We have only two other Nokwa death walkers left and a dozen hunters, but we can play a new game. The hunters of their tribe are young and inexperienced. Dayak, come! It is time for you to be of some use. Will and Cassie shared guard duty, and so far, deep in the night, there had been no disturbances. And they spoke in low tones and kept their backs to the fire to maintain as much of their night vision as possible. Uncle Jim had given them the goggles, but admonished them to learn how to do it without the tech. Then the tech will be a real benefit. It was a fixation with the man. Yet, one didn't get to be 80 years old and survive a dangerous career without possessing some wisdom. Well, it's cold up here, it's back home in the winter, Will observed, not saying much. We don't really have winters, but you know what I mean. And Cassie nodded. Well, I don't see how anyone could stand how cold it must get the rest of the year. What Uncle Jim told us about spring? A low sing-song voice intruded on their senses and they both grew quiet and looked out into the dark. Cassie took the first turn with her goggles, while Will scanned the darkness with his eyes, oh natural. The volume of the singing increased, a soft voice, feminine, full, not of hunger but of promise, sensuous and implying need. Will was fascinated, Cassie less so. Got her, she's on the other side of one of the big firs with Limbs that reach to the ground. She's just pacing. Maybe swaying a little. Hair is wild and she's gotten skinny, but I think that's her girl. She's alive and actually helping them. A voice rasped behind her. Wow, we used to call that stuck home syndrome. Cassie and both Will jumped in startlement. They had focused on the front and Uncle Jim had come up quietly at an oblique angle. That's when the hostages develop empathy with their captors. Worst kind of converts and our converts are fanatics. The old man completed. Well, whatever she's doing there, no others involved. Wait, let me check in for Red. Cassie switched the mode of the goggles. Nope, no other heat signatures. Maybe she escaped. Hmm, her mentor growled low in reply. Not likely. Better chance that they have set up some type of trap of their own. Notice that none of ours have been sprung. A shadowy figure approached and stood beside Jim. What's up? What's that weird singing? Asked Derek. At first, no one answered. But then Will, affable as usual, spoke. We think it's Dakota. She's out there in the trees. And Derek slowly processed the information and then bolted out into the forest yelling, Dakota! Jim and Cassie turned to Will. Seriously? You had to tell dumb Derek? Cassie asked with raised eyebrows. Keep watch, Jim advised. Tell us what happens to him. The noise from Derek's repeated shouts had awakened the rest of the party, even Dylan. 
Everyone, please stay quiet and ready your weapons. If it's going to break loose, it will do so soon. Oh shit, Cassie exclaimed. Derek just disappeared. Check the thermal scope again, Jim rasped. Uh, there's some blips and blops, not very distinct but moving, she reported. Down low to the ground, crawling maybe? Yes, under covers, back to one heat signature. I go. She's standing. I can't really make out her features. Dakota! Dylan's voice sounded from his pilot. He wasn't as loud as Derek had been, but there was no doubt that a figure out there heard. He called again. Dakota! It's me, Dylan! Your brother! I need your help! I'm hurt! She's definitely in doubt, Cassie said. By then, TJ had slipped off his own goggles. Well, she's leaning towards us, but her feet look glued to the ground. Crap! Two more just popped up behind her. They're dragging her back into the trees. Do we chase? He looked at Jim. Not just their great uncle at this moment, but their trainer, their mentor, their team leader. Jim rubbed at his chin whiskers. Nope. That's what they want. Just get us out there on their terms. Ah, this is our behavior for them. Something different, but with their usual goal to separate parties, spread fear and doubt, and then cause panic. Clever cannibal creeps. Dylan had sunk back onto his bedroll in a wave of dizziness and nausea. Pl please help her. Please save my sister. Tears rolled down his cheeks and even Harry, who detested the young man, remained silent. A basso rumble emanated from the other side of the biggest boulder. Got two more, the little scoundrels. They try to sneak up on us while we focus the other way. Guess the tribe will have Derek Stew to pass around later. Bjorn observed as he walked around the edges of a large piece of granite while he wiped at his blade. Several more ran off into the dark. They expected to murder us, not enjoying a battle. Hard behavior for a desperate group. They have plenty of food and no reason to keep up this fight. Even his primitives will know that by tomorrow afternoon or the morning after, this area will be swarming with people who will be out to get them. Jim shrugged. If their plan had worked, they would have had even more food and plenty of time to pack up and leave. Best we stay on watch though. They may try our last full-on assault. Last thing we'd expect. Or the eerie wailing cry that had so often haunted their trails sounded from out in the forest. It was matched by another from a different direction, and then a third. As one would fade, the next would begin until a chorus blended into a horrific concert. Trying to attack our resolve, the old man rasped. They keep up that obnoxious racket, they just might. An object came hurling out of the dark and over the big boulder, and it landed near Dylan's pallets and then rolled near the fire. It was Derek's head. As it came to a stop, the noise ceased, and half a dozen javelins arched over the opposite set of rocks, and one of them grazed TJ's back and elicited a hiss from the youth. Another landed between Bjorn's and Numa's feet. Cover! He thundered as he stepped over and snatched Dylan. He placed the young man under the eaves of one of the boulders and took up a stance with his back to it. And one of his hands was filled with a large frame pistol, and the other with his Sayax. The rest of the team reacted swiftly, and each used the rocks for cover, even as another volley of projectiles descended. And Jim, rifle in hand, stepped out of the way from the perceived cover and took aim into the night. He fired off six rounds in rapid succession, then dropped to one knee as he pivoted and fired another six in the opposite direction. In addition to the sharp cracks of his rapid fire, there was one scream and a couple of squawks out under the trees. Rotten sons of bitches, he called out to the remnants of the cannibal horde. Your game is up. Leave us the girl and get on going and we won't hunt you down and kill every last one of you. He glanced at his companions meaningfully. Contract or no, he spoke in a low, angry growl. Just before dawn, they were pelted with stones and Harry took a glancing blow to his forehead. I left a nasty gash and a lump, but 
no serious damage. As the party surveyed the land around them, they caught glimpses of pale, spiky figures. The figures no longer held horror, they simply made for easier targets. Beyond's pistol roared and one of the figures collapsed. He grinned at Will and Cassie and they saw a look of fear mingled with anger consume Cassie's features. Her rifle snapped up and she fired just over his head and a heavy weight impacted the back of his shoulders. A rusted camp axe thudded to the ground beside him as he shook off the encumbrance and turned to stomp on the neck of a, a corpse. He looked at his saviour and nodded. Nice shooting, ma'am. Glad you were paying attention. And Cassie grinned and winked. Just like the old man, he thought. The helicopter rose to take Dylan and Harry to the hospital where Whitehorse and Derek's head <laughs> elsewhere. The DMTS team, which officially consisted of Bjorn, remained on the bank of the Yukon River at the base of the trail. Jim, leader of the unofficial team, rubbed the whiskers on his chin. I made a promise. One last chance you all don't have to join. You can jump here until I get back. I don't. Those savages made the decision to press the fight. They still have that Dawson girl, and I'm not putting up with that. They are bound to have a hidey hole somewhere nearby. They have women and young'uns people who need to be sheltered. Even in the wild, the strong protect the weak, if only to survive. And he looked at the three youngsters and then at Bjorn. Don't get me wrong, I don't typically refer to natives as savages. It only applies to cannibals and slavers. And Bjorn gave a knowing nod. They talked for a while, and Jim suggested that they try looking in the abandoned mining camp. No doubt they were holed up there before our little expedition arrived last spring. It didn't leave much imprint, but they rarely do. Maybe they hadn't been there too long. Now that the searchers have cleared out, they will maybe have moved back into the buildings. Maybe just the saloon. Good place to start. With no better options, they trekked up the river and to the dog sled trail that Jim had followed the previous spring. We have driven out the intruders from our territory. Nok Cha glared around the old mining camp, saloon, at the pitiful remnants of his tribe, daring any to disagree. They have harmed us greatly. Many of them will come soon, so we must move the tribe. Time to migrate away. There is a bad medicine in this place. The others mumbled wearily in agreement. We will give our injured a day and a night to recover, and then we will go. The Ak sat in a corner near the fireplace, and she had been here briefly, before she had fled down the mountain and into the waiting arms of the Wendigo Nation. She kept her head down but raised her eyes. The tribe had welcomed her once she had stopped fighting and trying to flee. And she held some status as a breeding woman, the others, her brother. They might not accept her after all that had been done to her. All that she had done, had eaten. No, she could not think of that. And she was miserable, but trapped. And there was no one to help, nowhere to go that would be safe. And the trek had taken a long time, much slower than dog sleds and gym was extremely warm when the daylight started to fade. He reckoned that they were still an hour from the old encampment, and he slipped back to the rear and attempted to be the rear guard. Put that boy! TJ, who kept a wary eye on him and had set the pace for the others. A too slow pace. He called a halt and they left the trail. They soon found a small clearing with an old stump at its center. A drop-off provided a view of the draw between the ridge they had ascended and the next which was slightly more barren. Good place to bed down and get some rest before we play our games, he hoarsely said to the others. TJ, you take first watch with me. Cold camp. As the last rays of the sun faded, he sat beside his great nephew and looked out onto the next ridge. They hadn't spoken much, each absorbed in his own thoughts. Then Jim spotted movement on the other ridge. 
and TJ saw it at the same time. They kept their eyes on the object that had disappeared behind a fluffy pine. Guess we both saw that. Pretty big and too thick for one of our people eater buddies. Jim rattled out conversationally. TJ thought that Uncle Jim was loud at times, yet he admitted to himself that he felt the need to whisper sometimes when it was not needed. The old man did not like whispers, and so he replied in the same tone. Bear? And Jim grunted. Hmm. They can walk on two legs, but usually for four or four. Maybe. The figure rose in the dusk and was briefly outlined for them. Elder and youth gasped together. Bugger squatch! The figure turned, took a few loping steps, and was gone into the new, fallen night. They looked at one another. Each wore an expression of awe. I'd given up on ever seeing one of the big northern species, Jim rasped, and TJ just smiled in genuine contentment. A whistling sound caused De Ak to stir in her sleep. It was far away from her pallet in the back room of the old saloon. Her mates rose from beside her and moved out to the main room of the structure, along with the remaining death walkers and hunters. The whistles persisted until all were awake in the pre-dawn, and then a howl broke forth from just outside the door. That old wolf, hoarse and rasping. I was quickly followed by the screeching of big cats from either side and the roar of a bear from the rear of the building. The entire tribe was awake and stirring. The death walkers donned their costumes and assembled their sharp pieces. The others gathered their weapons, and they prepared to make a charge for the door. The women and the children huddled at an area on the rear of the building, the most fit arrayed in the front of the weak or infirm. The howls of the old one turned to yips and then ceased. The rest of the animal noises quickly died away in a grey light of a false dawn. Nok Cha shifted nervously. It is but a trick. There are no animals in the trees, only intruders, desperate intruders. And from somewhere in the queue of warriors came a querulous voice. Are they spirit walkers, animal ghosts wearing human prey skin? No, Nokcha barked, just foolish interlopers playing games, and we will show them hunting games. It is the Wendigo who will win the game and eat of their flesh. He gnashed and chomped his vile teeth. Go! And with that, he took his own advice and charged out from the doors, and his raiders followed suit in a rush through the narrow outer door. De Ak huddled in a corner, farthest away from the Afri. She shook and stared at the backs of her tribe members. Her mate was last in line of the charging warrior hunters, the others knew of his ferocity. They would rather face enemies than him, and so would I, she shuddered. As the last of the crowd pushed out to their rendezvous with destiny, the back wall rattled loudly, and dust puffed from the edges of the now cracked logs, and the axe scuttled away from the wall and squeaked in terror. The others turned to see what had happened. At about the time, another blow struck the back wall of the structure, and this time, the end of the log drove through. We quickly withdrew and then returned in an overhead blow that tore an opening through the already damaged structure. Large hands with thick fingers grasped at the torn edges of the log pieces and pulled them aside as a roar ensued forth from an enormous chest. The creature that burst through was covered in dust and fragments of decaying wood, and it grasped a large shining blade in one hand and a ridiculously small looking camp axe in the other. The eyes were as wild as the hair, which bristled in an unruly mane. The being stopped and stood heaving, eyeing its potential victims. The elder of the women, who must have enjoyed punching the others, screeched and attempted to drive an old kitchen knife into the being's midsection. He stopped it with a casual flick of his hand that left the camp axe buried in her skull. The knife rattled to the floor and into the axe grip. She turned to flee from what she now realized was the bear-like man, and then her mate was before her. 
At the noises behind him, he had turned from his task of driving forward the other hunters and saw her before him, eyes wide in terror, the eyes of a trapped animal. He raised his hand to strike her as he had so often, but in her perception, everything slowly became clear. A rasping, old man's voice chuckled in her memory. Besides, a good pig sticker will get you out of all kinds of spots. And with that, she plunged a knife to the hilt in the solar plexus of her tormentor, and then twisted and carved downward. He screamed in her face as his entrails extruded through the wound, and she let go of the knife and collapsed backwards onto the floor as her mate, her tormentor, turned away and slumped to the floor in the doorway. She shook and felt her gorge rise, but then a huge paw, or a hand, extended towards her. Come with me, a deep voice rumbled as she was plucked up and carried through the new exit at the rear of the building. And during it all, the noise had only slightly covered the cracks of rifles as the hunters were cut to pieces in front of the building. And there were cries of pain and fear and less pleasant noises, thuds of boots striking flesh and yells in the odd, complicated language of the prey folk, those who would not be food today. And the axe stood by and shivered under the blanket, the first clean piece of material she had smelled in months. She looked around at the pitiful, broken bodies of her now defeated tribe. Her former mates lay crumpled in the original doorway to the little saloon. For all of his ferocity in life, he was now just a mill waiting to be devoured. And she shuddered. Not by me. No more such atrocities. The other women and children and babies huddled to one side of the building. A few cried, but most just looked on in fear and awe. Bjorn shook his head at Jim. It wasn't really a mission to rescue all these folks. What will we do with them? And Jim humped. If I know DMTS, they will want to study them. As you know, we don't try to wipe out cryptids, but rather learn their origins and the purposes they pursue. Get on that fancy Ready Didio and ask. Worst case, the Canucks will take them and place them in their welfare system or release them to one of the First Nation tribes. In any case, do you want to just leave them? Beyond shook his head. No. We've, uh, abrogated enough responsibility when it comes to victims. And that's what most of these are. Shall we get started? The helicopters rose in the mid-morning light, filled with frightened, screaming people and children, until only one craft remained. Beyond signal for everyone to board, but once they did, Cassie, seated next to Dakota with Will on the other side, looked around. Where's Uncle Jim? He didn't get on one of the other copters. I watched. And TJ gave her an enigmatic smile. Uncle Jim has decided to stay for a while. He's found some new friends out here in the wilds. It turns out we were right. He's not well. He wouldn't let Ed or anyone else at DMTS treat him. Claimed it was unnatural. He said that he wanted to finish out his run here in this beautiful isolation. Or maybe do some spelunking with his... Overgrown troglodyte bodies, he quoted, in his best Jim Broxton rasp. Can't say that I blame him. Bjorn smiled and gave the signal, and they rose. TJ smiled at Will and handed him a knife. He wanted you to have this as a reward for having the best grin I've ever seen. It was his old K-Bar. One of his Marine Corps buddies gave it to him during his tour in Vietnam. Will looked around, a little embarrassed. Uh, shouldn't this go to you, Cassie? And Cassie leaned around their smelly charge and placed a hand on top of his. He wanted you to have it. He's given each of us little items. And this was special and you two had a special bond. And Will proved Uncle Jim right by offering his magnificent lopsided grin. Hey, did I tell y'all about that time he was stuck on a plane with a bunch of diplomats? They had a fuel leak and they were not going to make it to a safe landing spot. And so the flight crew asked for three volunteers to jump out of the plane to reduce the weight. Well, the first was an Englishman. He walked to the door and the wind whipped all around. 
and he shouted, God save the queen, and jumped. The second leapt to his feet and shuffled over and shouted, Viva la France, and out he went. Uncle Jim, as the Texan, just couldn't let himself be outdone, and so he stood, picked up a Mexican diplomat, and tossed him out the door as he shouted, Remember the Alamo. Bjorn eyed Will askance. Are you sure you're not related directly to him? Brain greeted Bjorn at their primary office and beckoned him inside. Welcome, my young apprentice. He intoned in his best movie villain impression. He indicated a third party seated to one side of the room. I believe you are already acquainted with this lady. He grinned in a more reserved manner than he normally would do. Ed, Bjorn rumbled. Long time. Eloquence is always, Cub. The prim woman in great stated. What have you done with my father? And Bjorn stood, looking confused. Another one of her tests? He asked himself. No test. I want to know what happened to my father. He did not come back and he hasn't answered his communicator. And we have been unable to track him. Did you get my daddy killed? For the first time since Bjorn had met her, he heard just a hint of a crack in her voice. and saw a slip in her demeanor. Uh, no ma'am, he replied, and then realized she would want to know more. I thought perhaps he would have told you, or maybe TJ would have. Uh, Jim decided to stay in the mountains, said he was sick and tired and preparing for the end. And TJ explained that they had seen what he called a booger squatch the evening before we took out the nest of Wendigos. Jim decided to try and make friends with them and spend his remaining days there, away from any rescue or treatment. He told TJ that he was now just Jim, not Uncle Jim or Jungle Jim or Cat Catcher, but plain old Jim. Very old Jim. Bjorn caught the faintest sag in Ed's posture and facial expression. It was fleeting and soon replaced with a typically insouciant manner. Stubborn Broxton men always have to do things their own bloody way, she intoned. So, what do you think of the apprentice program? Bjorn shrugged. You have started with a great group. Each has talents that complement the others and, well, I like them. They're decent and competent young people. Brain's grin widened. Wonderful. Then he won't mind taking over their training for a new mission. Don't worry. It's down in the neck of the woods. Literally. And you'll have to help one of your old buddies, Blue Jay. Now, apparently, some of the post-Harvey mutant creatures escaped our efforts and have bred up a third generation. Wow, 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 wow. Certainly another one. Wow. Absolutely chest pounding. What a wonderful tapestry of horror there. Woven like an absolute expert in the sinister and ferocious way that only Michael G. Lockhart seems to manage. A big, big thank you to Michael, my brother from another, for his incredible support on the show and outside the show. It really means so, so much to me. I can't thank you enough. Well, Guys and girls, you know the drill here. Please do let me know. Please do let me know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. Of course, if you're an aspiring writer or would just like to have a crack at things, why not get in touch with myself at the usual email as on screen, which is DMT. Forest of Fear at gmail.com. I look forward to hearing from you. I hope everybody's doing good this week and are getting stuck into whatever it is that you do, studying or work, and you're trying to keep fit and focused as possible during these testing times. But above all, remember, be safe, not sorry.